Hey guys, so my name's Paul, along with my wife Tony and my three sons. We pastor Freedom Church Cardiff, and it's great to be with you this morning on our fourth instalment of the Generation Series. I don't know about you, but it's been an amazing um, series. I have loved the big three questions that we've been asking. Who am I? What's my purpose? And what difference will I make? And, you know, we all recognise at some stage in our lives, we're all going to ask one of those three questions. And um, I love last week's message as well, but that Sean preached about the scripts, what scripts we write in for the next generation. I just think they've been, we've hit some really big uh, questions and I was like, how do I follow this? Uh, how do I follow all of that? And I just felt the Lord remind me of a character in the Bible and you're gonna know him. Uh, we all know him, maybe through the song that gets sung. And it is Joseph. And if you've never, if you live in a different country, you've not heard of Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. There's a song that goes with it. There's a whole musical that hit Broadway and the West End. And it's, I close my eyes, throw back the curtains. Come on, I can hear you. Whoa. And, uh, and so we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph. You might think that you grew up in a crazy family. I can tell you that there has not been a more crazy toxic family than this family that we're going to read about this morning and so I'm really excited to unpack something of the life of, of Joseph and so we're going to pick up the story uh, we've as we've gone through this generation series we've talked about the God of Isaac Abraham and Jacob and so Jacob he has 12 sons and he has four different wives and that's why you can see how it gets crazy. He's a liar, he's a deceiver and he's gone throughout his whole life creating chaos everywhere he's, he's been and yet God steps in, changes his name, calls him Israel and promises him that he's going to be a father to a many nations. And so here he is, he's got 12 sons, There's, that's the father of many nations right there. And But he has this one particular son who he loves more than the others. So he's setting Joseph up for an absolute nightmare. I'm going to pick up this story and um, we pick it up. And if you want a title for this message, it could be one or two. It could be the generational test because I think every single one of us are going to go through some of these tests. Or it could be the testing of a dream. So you can take your pick what one you're going to write down. But we pick up the story in Genesis um, 37 verses 5 to 11 and it says this. It says now that Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him. I'm just going to stop there. There's some dreams that God gives you, you just need to keep to yourself. But we'll carry on. And he hated him even more. And he said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered round and bowed down to my sheep. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. It gets worse. He has this other dream. Now you'd think after the first dream where they hate him, he'd just like, oh, I'm just going to keep this next dream to myself. Oh, no, no, not Joseph. He goes on with this dream and he goes on and he said, then he dreamed another dream and he told it to his brothers and said, behold, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, I've the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept them saying in mind. It's amazing that Jacob, he rebuked him, but he didn't dismiss it. He kept it uh, to himself. And right, right from the offset, I just want to say that God has a plan for your life. God has a dream for your life. You know, there's no pressure. I think sometimes we get so, we can feel the pressure to come up with a plan and a purpose for our lives. But I want to just encourage you this morning. You don't need to feel the pressure of that. God's got you. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose uh, for your life. I love it in Joel 2 where it says that your young men will dream dreams. Your old men will dream dreams. Sorry, your young men will see visions. You know, that's a generational verse we read about in Joel. He's, he's prophesying, he's saying that your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. The youth are going to get the vision. The youth are going to run with a vision. And that's why I'm excited about our zeal age guys and our young adults that they've got a vision, that they've got a vision, that God is going to place a vision on their life. So it's a generational verse. You know, God has a plan 
for every generation. I just want to encourage you, if you're not young, maybe you're more advanced in years, God's not finished with you. He's still got a plan and a purpose for your life. You know, but when God gives us a dream, every dream that God puts in our heart, there's a gap between the conception of the dream and the fulfillment of the dream. It's the place where God tests whether you can handle it. And I just want to encourage you, if you're dreaming something this morning and it doesn't scare you, I just want to say it's probably not a God dream. When God gives you a dream, it freaks the living daylights out of you. You just think, God, there's no way I'm going to be able to achieve this. And so this morning, I just want us to look at four areas uh, where I believe that God wants to grow. So I'm just going to pray super quick and then we'll unpack it. So Father, I just thank you this morning. Lord, as we just come... Uh, around your word. Lord, I just pray that you'd illuminate something to our hearts, I pray, through the life of Joseph. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but I love going to eat at restaurants. I love going out on holiday. I love all those things. But every time we go somewhere, Tony wants to take a picture. And she'll say, it's just for memories. And we'll stand there with the camera, the phone like this, trying to get the perfect picture. But I'm one of those terrible people that I'm not the most photogenic. So every time the picture gets taken, I've got my eyes shut or I've got the weird like face every single time. And so I dread having my picture taken. But you know when you go to a restaurant and you want that nice group photo and so you look, you look for someone to come and take the photo, you ask the waitress and sometimes you get the waitresses that are amazing or the waiters and they're amazing at taking a picture. They'll give you a handful, they'll take a few and they'll say, here you are, you can take it. But there's nothing worse than you give the camera to the shaky hand guy. I'm the shaky hand guy. If you give me the camera, I'll be shaking. My hands will be shaking. You'll get it back. Everything's blurred. There's too much, there's too much ceiling or there's too much floor. It's never right. I, so I'm banned from taking photos. Group photos don't ask me. I'm the shaky hand guy. But there's nothing worse than you give the camera to somebody else and they take 60 seconds and they only take one photo. And that one photo is the one that I've got my eyes shut on. It's an absolute nightmare. But there's something about taking a photo and I feel there's something about what the younger generation missed that we had and what I had in my generation is that you used to go out with a camera you'd get 24 shots to get it right or 36 if you were really posh and paid that little bit extra for the extra films and we used to have this camera you, and you just literally point and shoot and then you take the film you get it developed and then you come back and notice that all your pictures were blurred or shaky. In my case, everything was shaky and ever, nothing was in, in like the sort of area of where you wanted it to be. But there's something about a film. And I think God works like he does with a film. You know, you, basically the, the, the whole thing was you take the film to a shop and then in the shop they would take the film out. They'd carefully cut it in a dark room. They'd cut it into single pieces. They'd then put it in this solution. They'd then hang it up to dry. But then once the, it dried, they would bring it out in the light for everyone to see. And do you know what? I think that's a glimpse of the process that God takes us on when he puts our dreams in the dark room. I think God puts our dreams in the dark room of development. You see, he takes us through the process to get us ready for perseverance. He literally develops us in the dark room before anyone can see you. He gets you ready for the dream of your life. It's the testing of a dream. You know, but I think many of us, we want to dream on Sunday and see it come to pass on the Monday. But we got to wait. Sometimes you, you, could, you could pay extra to get your photos developed in an hour or you could have to wait for like 36 hours. And it's just like, but there's a, there was a wait there was a weight to it. More often than not, I was really disappointed when my pictures get developed. I know all the young people watching this, they're thinking, I don't even know what this guy's on about. That's how ancient uh, I feel sometimes. But do you know what? You, Joseph tells his brothers the dream and his brothers hate him. But do you know what? We're going to have to go through some stuff sometimes. You see, sometimes you have to become who you're supposed to be so that you can do what you're supposed to do. Sometimes we have to go through some stuff because it shapes us. And so this morning I want to look at four tests that God wants to take us through. First test is the rejection test. You see his brothers rejected him. Your dream is not always going to be popular with people. I don't want to upset anyone this morning. Maybe you were looking for a nice encouraging message this morning. Your dream is not always going to be popular with everyone. 
all of us at some stage in our life are going to face rejection. Joseph's family rejected him. You see, rejection is inevitable, but you have to choose how to accept it. We pick up Joseph's rejection story in Genesis 37, 27 to 28, and it says, come, let us sell him. He'd basically gone out. His father had sent him, a, sent him to find his brothers who were looking after the goats and sheep, and he said, hey, go find your brothers for me. So here comes Joseph with his bright coat. I mean, he's wearing this massive bright coat in the middle of the desert. They see him coming a mile off, and they say, come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not a hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listen to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up, lifted him up out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. You see, the brothers saw him coming, thought, hey, let's just get rid of this one. It's unfair that dad loves him more than he loves us. And so they decided that they were going to dispose of Joseph. And so they put him in a pit. At one stage, they're planning on killing him, but they decide, we'll put him in a pit. And you know, very often, sometimes we can feel like that, that we've been rejected by those that love us. But guys, I want to encourage us, let's not live for man's acceptance, but for the approval of God. You see, Elijah was rejected, Jeremiah was rejected, Peter was rejected, Paul was rejected, and even Jesus was rejected. You know, Proverbs says that the fear of man is a trap. When you think about it, our whole church is built on a rejected person. You know, I, th I think it's Peter that says this, that we're the stone that the builders rejected was the cornerstone that we're built on, and that's Jesus. And so even Jesus was rejected. And so you might feel rejected this morning, but good things can come from that rejection. You see, Joseph is rejected, but he keeps his spirit sweet. Our problem is that we take rejection and get offended and let offense take hold. We take it personal and let offense take hold. You see, but your dream will not be accepted and praised by everyone. But when it's rejected is, can you stay sweet? Can you still love people? This morning, I just want to ask that question. How will you respond to rejection? So Joseph, he's rejected by his brothers, gets put in this pit and they sell him onto these traders. Basically, Joseph ends up then in Egypt at a guy named Potiphar's house. Potiphar buys him. And the moment Joseph rocks up to Pyramid Hills, things for Potiphar take off. I mean, the favour of God comes on that house and things take off. It says that he was successful in the house and his master saw that the Lord was with him. I mean, everything that Joseph started to put his hand to started to prosper. And because of that, Potiphar starts to prosper. You see, you don't need to wait for the perfect conditions to thrive. It's a state of heart and a state of mind. You know, I, I grew up hearing a story about these two girls. One was a pessimist, one was an optimist, and there was a pile of dung on the floor. And the one girl, was the pessimist, was like, Ugh, oh, look at that. Oh, that's disgusting. The optimist was, I can't wait to see what horse that came from. It was this massive pile of dung. And she was like, I can't wait to see what horse that was. It, it, your life depends on how you view it and how you look at it. And when the favour of God is on you, there isn't anything that can stop you. I've got this saying that favour ain't fair. You see, Potiphar's only concern when Joseph was at the house with, was whether he was eating Mackey D's or Burger King. He didn't have to touch anything because Joseph looked after him. And it just says that all he had to worry about was what he was going to eat. The only thing outside of Joseph's authority was the first de desperate housewife of Egypt. This woman, she was thirsty. No, no, I'm talking thirsty. And it wasn't for drink. She is desperate. And here we come to the second test that every single one of us is gonna face, and it's the temptation test. So we're gonna pick up the story in Genesis 39, six to 12, and it says this. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form, a bit like Pastor Gary, and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, Lie with me, lie with me. But he refused. He said to his master's wife, Behold, because of my master has no concern about anything in this house, he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything from me except you, because you are his wife, crazy woman. 
That's my little bit. That's not in the Bible. Uh, from me, except you because you were his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, there's always going to be a but one day when temptation comes. He went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me, lie with me, Joseph. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. She is thirsty and desperate and she is after Joseph. And he's like, she's asking him to lie with him. He like runs a mile. You see, he said, you can take my coat, but you can't take my calling. And he flees. You see, the test comes in the form of seduction, but Joseph sees it as a test of loyalty, of heart to God. And I, I just think there's three keys, just in this little passage alone, there's three keys that I really just think are areas that we need to be faithful in. Number one, faithful in the small things, faithful in the first things, and faithful in the things that belong to others. You know, the Bible says there's no temptation that has overtaken us that is common to man, but God is faithful and will provide us with a way out. In other words, it's saying this, do you know what, no matter what you go through, there's always a way out. Every single one of us will face temptation, even Jesus faced temptation, but they, God will provide a way out for us. So run, you don't have to stay in the place of temptation. I think that's one of the misconceptions that we get. I always hear it, oh, I'm just so tempted, but we don't have to stay in that place of temptation. We can run. I love the picture that here's Joseph, he's passed the rejection test, but here's the crazy woman, the first desperate housewife of Egypt, standing there alone and rejected. She didn't pass the rejection test, but Joseph did. You can take my coat, but you can't take my calling. I love that, man, that's so good. I would make a t-shirt out of that. And so maybe that's a merch idea. Uh, but so Potiphar comes home and she's like, she stands out crying, help, help. Help. The guys come running in. Potiphar comes home. I mean, I guess, I guess he knows what she's like, but he's like, I'm going to believe you. He gets Joseph thrown into prison. And I don't know about you. I'd be thinking if I was Joseph, wow, God, great dream, great plans that he had for my life. I've ended up in a pit. I've ended up in Potiphar's house with the crazy woman. And now I end up in prison. And it's here in prison that he faces the third test, the isolation test. And this is where God does his best work. God does his best work in private. This is where God deals with FOMO. Anybody know what that is, FOMO, fear of missing out? I mean, there's so many of us, I think that we're in fear of missing out. We're scared that we've missed the dream. We're scared we missed the call. We're, we're scared that we're not with the right people or the right group of friends. And maybe we compromise because we don't want to miss out. This is where God does his best work. He doesn't work on you from the main stage but in the prison of isolation. You know, God is saying, me, that's God, plus nothing equals everything. He is all that we need. You see, this is where he builds us. He builds us in private. He strengthens us in the quiet. Again, Joseph starts to prosper. While he's in the prison, the prison officer, he leaves him, Joseph, in charge of everything, and Joseph begins to prosper. He meets these two guys in there. I don't know, I just picture the scene of like Shawshank Redemption, you know, when they're in prison and some guys are pushing weights and Joseph's doing his press-ups and they're walking around the yard and he sees the baker and he sees the butler and he's like, hey, yes, guys, what are you in for? And they're like, oh, I didn't do nothing, I'm innocent. I remember once I went to speak at a prison and it's one of the funniest experiences of my life. It was like everyone I spoke to just said they weren't, it wasn't their fault, they weren't, they were, they were all innocent. So every time I just, I don't know, I just got that image of prison and everyone was like, oh, I'm innocent, it wasn't me. It's just like funny. But this, this is where we see in prison that God really moves. This is where God does a lot of work in Joseph's life. The prison chapter for Joseph is one of the most sovereign moves that God has. And we can see that the butler and the baker, they both have these dreams. And it comes to the point that Joseph interprets these dreams. And as he interprets the dreams, one of them gets released. And Joseph says, when you get out, don't forget, don't forget me. Tell somebody to, to get me out. I'm innocent. I don't deserve to be here. How many of us have tried to get out of things that God has placed us in. You see, sometimes our timing is not God time, 
God's timings. We can want the right thing at the wrong time. And Joseph was wanting the right thing to get out, but it was just the wrong time. The purpose of God still needed to be fulfilled. You see, sometimes when we've been isolated, it feels like everyone's forgotten us. It feels like everyone's forgot that it was my idea. Maybe the friendship groups, maybe you're the one that always feels you're left out or missed the WhatsApp call or you didn't get invited somewhere or you always turn up late. And so sometimes when we have that prison mentality, we can, that isolated, we feel like we're always the ones that are left out. But I want to encourage you this morning, God hasn't forgotten you. God hasn't forgotten where Joseph was. He had him in the right place at the right time. And it's here that Joseph passes the test why? Because he remains sweet and the favour just keeps flowing. You see, it's here where God can take you from the prison to the palace in the flash. You know, in Genesis 40 verse 23 is Joseph's hoping that someone would remember. I think this is probably one of the worst verses of this story. It says, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. But God's not forgotten him. The years roll by, I think it was like two years pass, then all of a sudden Pharaoh gets this dream and he has these crazy dreams and he's just sharing it. Everyone is like, oh no, Pharaoh's had these mad dreams and he's looking for someone to interpret the dream and no one can. And then the cupbearer goes, I was in prison with a guy that he's really great at interpreting dreams. And so Pharaoh says, quick, go get him. And they call Joseph and he comes in and then... Joseph interprets the dreams. He has this amazing ability to interpret dreams. And as he interprets the dreams, everything begins to prosper and flow. And so the years pass by, the famine takes place in the land. Joseph comes from uh, the prison to the palace. Um, amazingly, what he was doing in, the, in Potiphar's house, he's now doing in the palace. And do you know what? I just want to encourage you this morning. Maybe some of the things that you're doing right now in your life that seem meaningless and don't feel like they're fulfilling the dream, maybe God is going to take you and excel what you're doing right now to a whole nother dimension in the future. And so he's doing, he's fulfilling all these things and then he's going to face the next test. And that test is the retribution test. You see, as famine was spreading throughout the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, his brothers and his father are running out of food and they hear that Egypt has got food and Joseph has been put in charge of all the food and administrating the food. And so Jacob says to his sons, go to Egypt and buy food. And as they rock up in Egypt to buy food, Joseph spots his brothers. Here Joseph has the chance to get his own back on his brothers. And we pick the story up in Genesis 45, verses 5 to 7. It says, Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. Joseph is talking to his brothers here. He said, Because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you, for you a remnant on earth, and to keep you alive for many survivors. Joseph hushed his brothers as they were crying out and feeling bad. Joseph hushed them and just said, whoa, whoa, whoa. It wasn't you that put me here. It was God who put me here. Guys, we've got to stop giving people the control and the narrative over our lives. You see, Joseph recognised, he would finally recognised that it was God that had placed him there, not his brothers. In chapter 42, verse 9, it said that Joseph remembered the dream about them. Then notice in verse 45 to 5 to 7, he says that God sent me to preserve life. You see, when he first dreamed those dreams of the sheaves bowing down, the dream was about them bowing down before him. But you know what? As God has developed the dream through the pit, through Potiphar's and through the palace, he's realized that the dream wasn't about him, but the dream was about others. And guys, I want to encourage us this morning that the dreams that God gives us it's never about us. It's always about others. You see here, Joseph passes the test. And here's the thing. The Old Testament is just a foreshadow of the New Testament. You see, Joseph is an Old Testament picture of Jesus in the New Testament. You see, Joseph brought about a deliverance, but Jesus brings about a great deliverance. Jesus brings about the salvation of the world. You see, Jesus, he also passes every single one of these tests. Jesus passed the rejection test. 
He was rejected by the religious people. Jesus passed the temptation test. He was tempted for 40 days in the desert, in the wilderness, and yet he passed. He passed the isolation test in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, could you not even pray with me an hour? He was alone in the garden. And Jesus passed the retribution test when he hung on the cross for your sin and for my sin. He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. You see, Jesus brought about a greater deliverance from sin, death and hell. The question isn't, does he have a dream for my life? Because he does. The question is then, is it can I handle the rejection? Can I say no to the temptation? Am I okay with the isolation? And here's the thing with isolation. Your separation is your preparation for your destination. Would you mind forgiving those that have wronged you and pass the retribution test? That really is the question of the testing of a dream. Guys, I really hope that blesses you this morning. I just really want to encourage you. Pass the test. God's got plan. He's got a purpose for your life. And so I just want to pray just before we hand over to location leaders. Father, I thank you this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the test that you've highlighted for us. Lord, I just pray for each one of us that we would be able to pass the test. In Jesus' name, amen.